Imagine sitting at your desk, engrossed in your work, when a colleague leans over and says, Andrea, you should go on The Biggest Loser. Maybe then you'll lose some weight and get a boyfriend. Maybe you're making a cu yourself a cup of coffee in the office kitchen. When an acquaintance stops and abruptly asks, have you seen a doctor about your weight? Or maybe you're discussing your career with your manager. And when you ask them for advice, they respond with, you need to think about this while awkwardly gesturing to your body size. Or maybe you're a team leader and you're chatting with your boss around who to promote to a leadership role. You put forward a team member who is plus size and your boss responds with disgust, no way, if they can't look after themselves, how can they look after a team? Let these comments soak in for a moment. Ask yourself, how would you feel if any of these were said to you? How would they impact your sense of belonging? How would they impact your ability to perform? What would you do? These comments are real and are shared with permission from clients or are my own. These experiences are awkward and embarrassing and distract someone from their work. They've prevented these people from feeling psychologically safe in their workplace. In one instance, they felt so awful that they burst into tears and went home for the rest of the day. For others, they stopped putting in as much discretionary effort at work and became less productive. They stopped sharing their thoughts and ideas, challenging the status quo, and stopped attending work social functions. They became racked with anxiety and fearful that the topic might come up again. And the young woman who was put forward for the promotion that she would not get, she left that company for another role and has gone on to have a very successful career in senior leadership with another employer. When it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, we talk about a range of topics, including but not limited to race, age, sexuality, gender identity, ability, neurodivergence, even menopause. All of these conversations are vital for workplaces that are inclusive and that are as safe and welcoming as can be. However, one topic is still taboo at work and that is the topic of body size. I know that bias and stereotypes about people in fat bodies absolutely exists. I know it through my own experiences, through stories that are shared with me, and through research such as the 2021 study co-authored by Professor Rebecca Poole from the University of Connecticut, which found 58% of people have experienced weight stigma at work. It's impacting the team members you work with, your colleagues, your customers, and your clients. The 2018 Australian Bureau of Statistics report tells us that over 67% of the Australian population are overweight or obese. This means, in turn, that the conversation about body size at work is well overdue. It's time to bring body size into the diversity, equity and inclusion agenda, and it starts with you, with all of us. Whether we call it weight stigma, weight bias, but the term fat phobia might be new to you. Weight bias is how you feel about somebody else's weight. It's the internalized beliefs and thoughts that you, you have that are a result of our cultural conditioning. For example, it's the belief that to be fat is to be bad, or that all fat people want to lose weight. Weight stigma is what other people experience from your weight bias. It's when your unspoken thoughts and beliefs become actions. It's when you say things like, 
oh, I could never eat that. Or have you heard about this new diet? We hear a lot in the media about fat phobia as it's become a term that is used interchangeably to describe weight bias and weight stigma. It's become an umbrella term to describe the shaming and discrimination that fat people experience. I believe that's because fat phobia contains the word fat, which gives it power. However, the meaning of fat phobia is quite different. And I wanted to call this out because words matter. And the word fat phobia doesn't get to the underlying issue of weight bias, which we absolutely must do if we get to unpack the societal conditioning that we so dearly need to do. The Butterfly Foundation, Australia's leading charitable foundation that supports people with eating disorder and body image issues, defines fat phobia as an abnormal and irrational fear of being fat or being around fat people. Most of us don't experience fat phobia in a clinical sense. What we experience is weight bias and weight stigma. And so what does weight stigma at work look like? In addition to the examples that I shared earlier, weight stigma at work comes in many forms. It can be as covert as thinking to yourself, do they really need to eat that? When a colleague takes a second piece of cake at morning tea, or choosing to hire a straight sized person over an equally qualified higher weight person because you think the slimmer person's going to be a better team fit. Now, I use the term straight size because that's a term that the fashion industry uses to differentiate from plus size people. Weight stigma at work can also be overt. It can be telling a team member that they need to lose weight or covering the cost of a weight loss drug under the guise of employee wellness. It's uniforms and team wear not available in all sizes. It's chairs that aren't big enough or that are uncomfortable for large people to sit in. It's team or company weight loss challenges that are not accommodating of various body sizes and fitness levels. It's only including straight sized people in your branding materials and it's not including body size in your anti-discrimination and your anti-bullying and harassment policies. Especially considering discriminating against someone because of their weight is only illegal in two Australian states, Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory. Just because something isn't illegal doesn't mean that it's not the right thing to do. Individually, these experiences may seem minor, but when they are compounded over time, they impact an individual's ability to feel that they belong, which in turn influences how they show up and how they perform, their psychological safety. Professor Amy C. Edmondson from Harvard Business School tells us psychological safety occurs when people feel safe to speak candidly without the fear of being shamed, embarrassed or humiliated. It is an important concept to consider because as organisational anthropologist and leadership expert Timothy Clark explains, high psychological safety drives innovation and performance. And if we look at this through the lens of Professor Poole's study, we can conclude that for the majority of employees, their ability to feel psychologically safe is limited and is therefore costing all businesses that we either own, run or are part of dearly. It's costing us in terms of employee engagement and wellbeing, inclusion. Because when people feel excluded, they look for somewhere where they do feel that they belong leading to increased employee turnover. And in a tight labour market, there is the risk for positions to remain unfilled is high. It's also costing you in terms of the talent that you attract to your business, as limiting the pools that you hire from results in less diversity of thought and perspectives of those with unique lived experiences. In addition, people who don't feel psychologically safe 
are afraid to speak up in meetings. They're afraid to share their thoughts and ideas, to put forward opposing opinions, to participate in, in discussions, to take risks. Tip Clark tells us that when people feel like this, they don't just push through the fear, instead they self-censor and shut down. They focus on pain avoidance and self-protection. Body size discrimination at work is also costing us in sick, terms of sick leave, well-being, and it's even exacerbating the gender wage gap. Research led by Timothy Judge at the University of Florida found that in the USA, plus size women are paid up to $19,000 less per year than their straight size counterparts. Now that's around 28,000 Australian dollars per year. Imagine what any of us could do with an extra $28,000 a year. Body size discrimination at work is costing us all. There is a real opportunity for businesses, employers and teams to incorporate body size into their DEI and employee engagement strategies. It's an opportunity, in fact a need, that is well overdue. And it's not lost on me that this may feel like a rebellious conversation to have and thing to do in our workplaces, but it really should not be. We should have been here a long, long time before now. Global advisory and analytics firm Gallup tell us that organisations who have highly engaged teams experience benefits such as 81% lower absenteeism, 18% more productivity, and up to 43% reduction in employee turnover, and a 23% boost to pro profitability. It's easy to see that organisations who don't look to create environments and cultures that are inclusive of all bodies are going to be left behind. I'm going to leave you with one key thing to consider today. Whether you're a business owner, an employer, a people leader, a team member, an employee, colleague, however you describe yourself in your workplace, there is one key thing that I ask you to explore. It is going to mean work for you on a deep personal level. And that one idea is, what do you need to do to unpack your beliefs and societal conditioning around body size. You can do this by becoming aware of when you're making judgments, whether silently or out loud, comments or assumptions about someone based on their body size. Maybe next time you see someone like me and a thought crosses your mind about their size, what they're eating, what's in their grocery trolley, or you want to give them some unsolicited dieting advice, I want you to stop and acknowledge that that is weight bias and it is within your control to change. Maybe next time you interview someone like me for your team or the me in your team comes to you for career advice and you think, oh, they're just not the right look or they're not the right cultural fit or if only they lost some weight, their career would go far. I want you to stop and acknowledge that that is weight bias and it is within your control to change. Next time someone like me inquires about working with you as a coach, a counsellor or a mentor, and you think one of their goals is going to be to lose weight, I want you to stop and acknowledge that that is weight bias and it is within your control to change. As you start doing this work, please show yourself compassion we have all been conditioned to have deep-rooted negative beliefs about ourselves and others based on our body size. But now that you know better, you can do better. So join me in being rebellious and eradicating the taboo that is talking about body size at work so that we can create environments where everyone feels that they belong and can truly begin to thrive. It's a conversation that is long overdue for us all.